Hello, everyone. This is your host, Mahek Shah, and welcome to a new episode of the Heart Success Podcast, where we discuss practical knowledge and the latest in the field of cardiovascular medicine. My main interests are in the field of heart failure, cardiac hemodynamics, pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure, mechanical circulatory support, thoracic solid organ transplantation. We will be spending the first few episodes discussing these topics. All listeners be advised that the podcast is for personal information, education, and entertainment only. Information from this podcast should not be used as medical dictum, and all decisions related to patient care should be made in consultation with care providers. In our first episode today, we will talk about recognition of heart failure patients that need more advanced care and evaluation of these patients from the point of view of an advanced heart failure cardiologist. Let's just uh, jump right into it. We have Dr. Ulrich Yordi with us today to discuss uh, patient selection in advanced heart failure therapies. Dr. Yordi is an internationally recognized expert in the management of congestive heart failure. Currently, he is the section chief of heart failure, cardiac transplantation, and mechanical circulatory support at Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, New York. He has received grant funding for clinical research from the NIH as well as the American Heart Association. He is past chair of the Mechanical Circulatory Support Council and currently serves on the board for the ISHLT, which is the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. Welcome to Heart Success, Dr. Yordi. Thank you, Mahak. It's it's great to be on your podcast. Thank you, Dr. Yordi. What are we Uh, going to do today? Okay. (laughs) I know I've been working with you under your guidance for the last one year, and one of the things I've noticed is that you do travel a lot on the job, traveling to different continents, actually. Could you tell us a little bit maybe about one of your recent travels that left an impression on you and uh, what it was? Yes, um, I'll be happy to. So lots of travel, uh, for the record, mostly business. (laughs) And um, heart failure is really a global phenomenon. So what we try to do in what has become a global community, especially in in transplantation and mechanical support, is to go um, have active exchanges with other programs. Uh, An example, I was just recently in Hamburg, Germany, where I went to medical school also, as it happens, and I participated in a local symposium there. My task was uh, to report to them how we do things in the United States, uh, specifically here at Montefiore, with a multidisciplinary team approach. In Germany, uh, there are a slightly different setup for mechanical support. It's largely driven by uh, surgical groups. The patient remains with the surgeons. As you know, in the U.S., we have, I would say, a somewhat more evolved collaboration of cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. So for me, it was great to be there, uh, to tell them how we do it, to listen to them, see what they do. And you begin to realize that different uh, scenarios in different countries require different approaches. But you always take something away. In this particular case, um, they reported to me use of new devices like the Impeller 5.5, which actually had been the first to implant, and use of uh, right-sided support after LVAD, which they do more often than here. In fact, I imported some of their techniques uh, back to us. And uh, this is an example of how we've gotten better over the years by learning from other centers. That's truly an international collaboration, as you would call it. So so before we start, you know, I'm going to give the listeners an opportunity to just understand uh, what the topic of conversation today is. What we really are going to go into is evaluation of heart failure patients. Uh, Especially the cases that are sick or patients that need advanced care. And how uh, do we identify these patients? And then typically how you manage them, though understandably, that is usually a smaller group of physicians dealing with the advanced heart failure patients. So despite the advances in medical therapy for chronic heart failure, advanced heart failure continues to have a fairly poor prognosis. We hear about options such as transplantation, durable mechanical circulatory support, which has, of course, improved outcomes within this population. Their introduction has, without a doubt, introduced a fairly significant complexity uh, in these patients' management, and most of their care occurs at these larger specialized heart transplant centers. Uh, Really at the forefront of management of heart failure are your PCPs, your primary care physicians, your primary Mm -hmm. cardiologists in your community. 
And uh, this talk is really directed towards getting a better understanding of this disease. And like I said, identification of markers for worsening of disease. Of course, when we talk about heart failure, we always talk about heart failure, reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction. Specifically for this talk, our conversation really revolves around the reduced ejection fraction because that's where most of our therapeutic options and most of our validated treatments are available. So Dr. Yordi is going to help us put some of these pieces together today. Uh, so talking about heart failure, could you tell us about the scope of heart failure within the United States? Yeah. So the scope of heart failure is uh, quite big. Just to give a few numbers, uh, approximately uh, 6 million Americans or people living in the United States, I should say, not being an American myself, about 6 million in the United States that have uh, congestive heart failure, uh, one form or the other, approximately half uh, with normal ejection fraction and approximately half with a reduced ejection fraction. This is uh, 6 million out of approximately 25 million um, worldwide. Uh, heart failure is uh, is complex, and the landscape has changed. The treatment landscape, I should say, when we're focusing here on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, has changed dramatically over the past 20 years. In 1999, I graduated uh, from fellowship, and I have been practicing uh, heart failure uh, and transplantation ever since. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, transplantation was, of course, uh, already in place for about 30 years. Uh, there have been some improvements there, but more or less it has stayed the same. Mechanical circulatory support was almost non-existent. There were uh, only uh, a few hundred cases, if that, every year in investigational studies with, uh, at the time, pumps that were not continuous flow pumps but very large um, uh, volume displacement pumps that lasted about one year, where if you fast forward, there are now thousands of cases, I believe around 5,000 uh, annually in the United States with continuous flow pumps. Back then, survival on the pump was approximately on average maybe a year. Uh, almost nobody survived the two years. Fast forward to the most recent results with continuous flow pumps uh, in the United States two-year survival is now approaching 80%, and that was about zero at that time. Now, let's keep in mind that this is uh, at the end for a relatively small, uh, very small percentage of uh, the heart failure population at large. Dramatic changes also in the medical therapy of heart failure, whereas in the mid-80s, uh, uh, when I started uh, training, uh, or medical school, I should say, the one-year survival of a patient who presented with advanced heart failure was probably around 10%. Whereas nowadays, the one-year survival of such a patient with implementation of all available therapies is probably rather around um, 90%. So what has changed is A, medicine, uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, more recently ARNIs actually, which have replaced or should replace ACE inhibitors and HEFREF, spironolactone, as well as uh, other uh, treatment strategies. Uh, the big role probably is not uh, for the advanced heart failure specialist to take care of a terminal patient and try to save a life. The big role for us as a community is to ensure that at the entry level, uh, when you first diagnose with heart failure by a PCP in a clinic somewhere, uh, these physicians or uh, associated healthcare professionals are knowledgeable about modern heart failure therapy. No, absolutely. And just if you're wondering what an ARNI is, is the new term we use for sasubitril while sartan, which I can barely say, which is angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors the new class of medications that has really revolutionized, I think, medical field and added a lot more to what we already had. Absolutely, uh, what you said, there is a profound benefit of using these medications in a large majority of the patients. Unfortunately, there are patients who will progress despite the best efforts, despite your medical therapies. Is there anything beyond medical therapies uh, that you consider in some of these patients that are slowly deteriorating despite your uptitration of your beta blockers, despite, despite your uptitration of your ARNIs, uh, what sort of other options do you have 
in these patients? Yes, that, that's a great question. Before I address that, let me just put the uh, Arnie or the trade name, if that is allowed on your podcast, yeah. is Entresto. And let me also say that I have no conflict of interest whatsoever uh, with this medication. Recent studies, the Paradigm study and the Pioneer study, very clearly showed that this drug is superior to ACE inhibitors. We often, uh, as practicing physicians, see studies, we see a statistically significant difference. And I would say the average consumer does not go uh, the distance to find out what impact would it have if medication A, in this case uh, an ACE inhibitor, was replaced uh, with medication B on a population level. So in the study, the difference in survival after about two years was about uh, 5%. So that would mean that I need to treat 20 patients for the duration of the study to save a life. Uh, it's not trivial, but it doesn't really uh, impress as much, maybe as the thought that we, as a heart failure clinic, follow about 4,000 individual heart failure patients here in, in the Bronx at Montefiore. If we were to transition all these patients, we would avoid 200 hospital admissions save 80 lives over a two-year period. I think uh, I'd like to underscore that for people to uh, understand how impactful a change in therapy is. But there was a comment I wanted to make about Arnie. Let me, let me address what is, I think, coming known as the big treatment gap between uh, medical therapy, which is extremely successful and will contain or reverse the vast majority of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and so-called uh, heart replacement therapy. I think the old paradigm, or until very recent, uh, the established paradigm was medical therapy. You do your best. You add possibly, uh, and hopefully often enough, a cardiac resynchronization therapy, pacemaker therapies, and then uh, all goes well. Or a uh, patient still uh, remains symptomatic. patient gets more ill we have to withdraw some of the neurohormone blockade, and now we're beginning to think uh, cardiac transplantation or mechanical circulatory support. In this uh, gap, uh, recently have entered the percutaneous valve therapies. And I'd like to say that uh, this used to be known as interventional, interventional heart failure, I would, I would like to call the whole field of structural heart disease uh, that we participate in structural heart failure. And structural heart failure is any heart failure syndrome that is induced by a structural abnormality of the heart. And of course, for us to be up to date, we have to probably, I'm not sure if you want to go there now, talk about uh, the important role of uh, functional mitral regurgitation in, uh, in heart failure. And think, what we can do about that. I think that's completely true. Uh, like you said, you know, you can't go long enough in almost any discussion in cardiology today before talking about the wonders of these new transcatheter therapies, be it TAVR in patients with aortic stenosis or be it mitroclip. And most recently, uh, the uh, two new randomized control trials that we found in functional mitral regurgitation which again is patients uh, really with a dilated uh, ventricle. You could uh, certainly, I think, tell our audience a little bit about these two studies that came out, maybe how they were different, and then if your outlook to how you treat these patients has changed after these studies were published. Yeah, um, I'm, I'd be happy to do that. So my outlook has changed, uh, I would say, quite dramatically. I would say as recently as... Uh, Six to 12 months ago, uh, if I had a patient with uh, mitral regurgitation, my focus would be on uh, lowering blood pressure and diuresing the patient, but not uh, really thinking about um, possibly fixing the mitral valve. Now, again, we talk about uh, functional mitral regurgitation in this case, where the valve is uh, structurally intact but where there are uh, ventricular or possibly atrial abnormalities that result in a, a malfunction of a structurally normal valve. It could be a, a ring dilation. It could be atrial dilation leading to ring dilation, mitral ring, or it could be tethering of the papillary muscles, 
where the valve is held back inside the enlarged ventricle and regurgitation ensues. Now, you mentioned there are two trials, the MITRA FR study and the COAPT study. And at first glance, uh, these seem to be very similar studies. Patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction and uh, functional mitral regurgitation were randomized to receive either optimal medical therapy or uh, a mitral clip where the leaflets of the valves are clipped together with a few clips, uh, one or more clips, I should say, uh, percutaneously to reduce uh, the degree of mitral regurgitation. The first study that was completed was a mitral FR study, and that study was solidly negative, lowering uh, expectations uh, for this therapy quite a bit. The second study, however, that came out uh, only about uh, 6 to 12 months later was a co-op study, where, again, at first glance, a very similar patient group was randomized, and long behold, the patients in, in the mitral group not only had a dramatic reduction in the number of uh, heart failure hospitalizations, but also a statistically significant reduction in mortality. Now, how do you um, consolidate these two studies published back-to-back in the New England Journal of Medicine with completely divergent results? Now, um, I I cannot go into too much detail, but the understanding at this moment is that probably the patients in the co-op study had a less uh, dilated heart and more mitral regurgitation relative uh, to the patients in mitral FR. This is still being investigated, but the current thinking, again, is that a certain type of functional mitral regurgitation, and when I say type, I mean defined by the degree of mitral regurgitation compared to the degree of left ventricular dilation, will be responsive to clipping. We differentiate now or possibly in the future between proportionate mitral regurgitation, where your heart's enlarged, you dilate up, you have some MR that's completely consistent with the degree of dilation of the heart, or disproportionate mitral regurgitation, where your heart is enlarged, you have MR, but there seems to be more MR than explained by just the the dilation of the left ventricle. Such patients appear to respond better to clipping. So given the really dramatic nature of the result, including a mortality benefit, uh, we have altered our practice very significantly and very actively screen for patients uh, with MR, optimize their medical therapy, and if their medical ther- if their mitral regurgitation remains significant uh, despite optimal medical therapy, we then uh, try to determine whether the MR is proportionate or disproportionate. If we feel it's disproportionate, we will refer uh, these patients for a mitral clip. I believe that's the future, and I believe that modern uh, treatment of heart failure by a heart failure specialist, or even by a primary care provider, should no longer be limited to optimizing uh, pharmacological therapy. It should include that, but it should also include identification of patients who might benefit uh, from percutaneous uh, valve repair procedures. This is a big change. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. I think this is really holding a lot of promise And uh, luckily enough, we have a new randomized trial in this field coming out hopefully in the next year or two, in addition to just more data, more interest growing in this field as we learn more and more about functional mitral regurgitation. So I think that at this point, that really brings us to these patients who haven't responded to all these other options we spoke about available in our armamentarium, and we start talking about advanced therapies. When I talk about advanced therapies, as Dr. Yordi previously mentioned, I'm really talking about patients that we consider for heart transplantation or durable left ventricular assist device. And uh, these are really sick patients. Just like you mentioned, the early randomized control trials showed that in the absence of durable therapies, the mortality on just inotropes or medical therapy at two years, was really 90%. So really a small fraction of patients survive. And these uh, durable devices have really revolutionized the field where now mortality at two years is roughly 20%. So, so quite 
quite a long way we've come in the last 15, 20 years in the field of durable MCS. So that brings us to these patients before you consider them for advanced therapies. Uh, what exactly is this patient that uh, are we referring to when we say that this patient has what we call advanced stages of heart failure or advanced heart failure? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first, when we evaluate a patient, we first, of course, must evaluate, uh, is their current therapy uh, optimal? Have they received the optimal recommendations by their physician? And equally important, have they been compliant uh, with the optimal recommendation? So again, in 2019, this would be uh, treatment with, let's talk, we will we'll focus on HEFREF here because only HEFREF is really subject to, or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, is subject to uh, durable mechanical uh, circulatory support with an LVAD. So have they been treated with uh, an ARNI, a beta blocker, if they have an indication for CRT, have they received CRT? Are they optimally managed with regard to diuretics? Uh, this has to be the case. If that's checked, then uh, the next question is, is their heart failure still at a high level functionally? Are they in a New York Heart Association class 3, 3B, or 4, despite optimal medical therapy? If the answer to that is yes, then the patient has an indication for mechanical uh, circulatory support, um, cardiocentric, so to speak. I like to first look at the heart and uh, make sure that this patient can actually receive an LVAD. Uh, it cannot be a restrictive cardiomyopathy. It cannot be a very small uh, left ventricle. We have to look at valves uh, that might have to be replaced uh, at the time of MCS implant. If the heart itself, uh, so to speak, is amenable to implantation of a left ventricular assist device, and generally it would be an at least somewhat enlarged heart with a severely reduced ejection fraction, then we have to ask ourselves the question whether the rest of the patient is amenable uh, to, um, to circulatory support. And Mike, as you know uh, from uh, training here at Montefiore, we always use the head-to-toe approach. So head... <laughs> Uh, in this case, does the patient actually want uh, to be uh, on mechanical circulatory support, live on batteries? Does the patient understand what it entails? Most patients uh, will need significant amount of explanation, but in my experience, most patients who we find to be medically suitable candidates will in the end agree that they would like uh, to live longer. And once they understand that, have you reached, uh, say, an inotrope dependent state? and your survival at two years is 10% or less, and you are offered a possible survival of 80%, you will make amends. You will consider uh, living on a durable support device with 8 to 10 hour battery life and uh, the need to at night, say, be plugged in. Um, with regard to the other organs, uh, to simplify this a little bit, you cannot have irreversible failure of other organs, i.e., end-stage COPD, end-stage renal disease, liver cirrhosis. In those cases, the surgery is usually not feasible or uh, life will actually not be prolonged. Uh, specifically, end-stage renal disease, uh, it is very difficult to maintain a patient on an LVAD uh, who also needs uh, dialysis. This can be done in select cases if uh, heart-kidney transplantation is anticipated, but certainly not for somebody in whom uh, the device is considered so-called uh, destination therapy. Another important thing is the interface of palms with blood. Uh, bleeding and clotting abnormalities has come with the palm. We have to make sure that the patient doesn't have significant uh, bleeding or clotting tendencies uh, prior to uh, implanting of those palms. Once that is established, uh, the rest is uh, surgical suitability. And I would say that most patients uh, with uh, HEFREF are surgically suitable even if they had two or sometimes three uh, prior stenotomies. Yeah, like we mentioned earlier, you know, this is a relatively smaller fraction of patients. I mean, some of the studies looking at patients with advanced heart failure, they do vary in what they quote the percentage of patients with heart failure, but that number usually falls between 1% and 10%. The other argument being made today is that as we're getting better and better, 
the prevalence, though, in our community of patients with advanced heart failure is increasing. And, and it's important, I think, the word that you will live longer. This is not a therapy that just makes you feel better. You will actually live longer with some of these other therapies. So it, it's important to communicate some of these things with our patients. When you are referred a patient, let's say, from a provider who's been managing a patient for several years, he's been getting worse slowly, more so recently. And when you see this patient in your office, what kind of testing do you use? Mm-hmm. What kind of questions do you ask um, to such a patient to really get a better sense of the extent of uh, disease? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So ha- having checked all the boxes on compliance and uh, optimal recommendations previously, the next test uh, usually in a symptomatic patient would be a right heart catheterization. And in a right heart catheterization, if the cardiac index is uh, less than two, uh, this is a patient that uh, likely will benefit from uh, implantation of a durable left ventricular assist device. It's a well-known roadmap a study registry, and in that study, patients who were not yet inotrope dependent, i.e. they had abnormal hemodynamics, but the clinical need to start an inotrope was not there, were uh, either followed or were implanted uh, with a durable LVAT. And the long and the short of that trial is that uh, survival at two years was not different if you wait it uh, until the patient clinically really uh, needed the device to simplify this a little bit. So there is no harm in waiting, but we also have to understand that if a patient is implanted when they are more sick, specifically when they're in shock, uh, the outcomes are not as good. So what we like to do is um, if the hemodynamics are abnormal, say index uh, less than 2, and a wedge pressure uh, over 20 to, to simplify this all a lot. Uh, but the patient does not have evidence of end organ dysfunction, i.e. arising creatinine, abnormal LFTs. I think it is reasonable to wait. At the moment uh, that the patient has uh, end organ dysfunction, I think we must proceed. Even if you wait, the patient should make a decision as to whether they are willing to take uh, an upfront risk of the surgery while they are in actually four LVAT uh, candidates in quite good shape, not uh, necessarily on an inotrope, intact end organ function, probably the ideal time uh, to operate. Uh, in the past, we have seen in the roadmap study that um, this approach, early implantation, was not justified. This may have changed. Recently, the MOMENTUM trial was completed, and as you know, we have seen, first of all, the first study in which essentially there is no pump thrombus anymore, and a very low uh, stroke rate of only about 10% at two years. Now, if you were to repeat uh, the roadmap study with this device, that's clearly better. Would it be different? It's possible, yeah? We struggle with the strokes. The strokes are much less now. Uh, Still, patients experience a higher number of GI bleeds. Again, less with the HubMe 3 device now. Certainly, one can discuss now when to implant earlier. Personally, I feel if the patient is symptomatic, and even though end organ function is not, end organ dysfunction is not there, sometimes I just like to put the patient on an inotrope uh, just to see how they feel. And if they, in the next morning, say, I feel so much better, then uh, I would probably recommend uh, to proceed with, uh, with an LVAT. Uh, if end organ dysfunction is there, proceed uh, anyway. Will this move forward to class three to improve the quality of life with patients with New York Heart Association class three heart failure uh, in the future? Yes. Uh, with the current available technology, I believe not. Uh, I would not recommend it. Uh, the next big step here, and it has been taken, is to have uh, a left ventricular assist device without a drive line, with full water immersion, with 8 to 10 hours uh, untethered existence. I think then once this has been implemented, tested, validated, uh, then we can begin to think about uh, New York Heart Association Class 3. At the moment, I don't think we're there. At the moment, I think most people would prefer to be in the Earth 3 uh, without batteries, without a major surgery. But I, mean, I think the future will bring this uh, with smaller devices that are true assist devices that are helping you on demand, uh, that are so-called smart pumps. But uh, we're not there yet. So new Earth 3, I would not consider it. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the other things I think we use more as transplant cardiologists or transplant heart failure doctors is these cardiopulmonary exercise tests. How often do you use these cardiopulmonary exercise tests in your patients? Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up. So cardiopulmonary exercise testing is an extremely important test. I'm going to be honest with you that when we see patients, for us, it's more often than not, just a validation of the impaired functional status of the patients. But I do believe that the test itself is used uh, not often enough. Clearly, you know, historically, thresholds uh, of peak oxygen consumption around 12 or 14 have been established. Uh, you know, Donna Mancini, over 20 years ago, uh, established this and basically reported that patients who have a VO2 of less than 14 or 12 for women benefit from cardiac transplantation because their survival would be around 75% or less in the first year, whereas at the time with cardiac transplantation, the survival was around 85 to 90%. This number still stands. This number is still used today. Once a patient comes in severely refractory uh, to medical therapy, uh, often uh, a right heart catheterization will, quote-unquote, seal the deal as the uh, cardiopulmonary exercise indeed is an indirect measure of your maximal cardiac output during exercise. Mm-hmm. But I will say this, in uh, the test should use, be used much more for screening purposes to identify patients who are in neurocardial association class 3 and prognosticate them. Often it is not so easy to prognosticate a patient, and we certainly use it very frequently in the uh, when we believe that advanced heart failure is uh, on the doorstep, so to speak, for the patient, test the patient and to be able to uh, let the patient know uh, what we believe will happen in the next year. Yeah, and then how often do you typically follow some of these, most of these patients? I know it's a spectrum of patients. But... A spectrum of patients, I would say stable patient in class 3 heart failure, we would probably see once every uh, four to six months. Often they are followed by uh, a primary cardiologist or a primary doctor. And people need to look for warning signs. Uh, We have not yet spoken about the very nice uh, I Need Help acronym. You know, this I Need Help uh, is each letter stands for a uh, condition. I uh, is the need for inotropes. N is the natriuretic peptides that are high or... Uh, you're unable to bring them down, i.e. a BNP level of over, say, 1,000 or 2,000 that doesn't come down, or an anti-pro-BNP level of 3,000 that you can't get down. I need, the other E is for end-organ dysfunction, we already discussed. The next E is for ejection fraction, less than 20%, where things should be considered. The D stands for uh, defibrillator shocks. If a patient has been stable and is now getting shocks and it's not explained by electrolyte abnormalities or other things, that may be a sign of worsening heart failure. H, of course, is uh, hospitalization. I think a very good rule of thumb is two hospitalization with hospitalizations for heart failure within six months despite optimal medical therapy should trigger uh, an advanced heart failure evaluation, including a cardiopulmonary exercise test and a right heart cath, refractory edema, or increasing diuretic dose. L is for low blood pressure. And P is for prognostic medications. Uh, I need help. It's nice and short. Uh, We can make it even shorter. If your patient remains symptomatic, despite optimal medical therapy, or importantly, fails, and you need to hospitalize the patients, or you have to withdraw life-saving therapies, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, because of low blood pressure, now it's time to start uh, an evaluation for uh, heart replacement therapy or possibly uh, uh, valve therapy before it is too late. We frequently get referrals from physicians where they say, I think it's time to think about a heart transplant because the patient creatinine is now three to four and we will shortly place a, a dialysis catheter. That's too late. And this is a common referral especially from the community where, you know, the physician is not exposed to uh, really wonderful options we have nowadays uh, that can be life-saving transplant or LVAT. So certainly uh, an increase, even a small increase in creatinine in your patient or the need to withdraw beta blocker A should trigger a referral to a heart failure specialist. No, actually, that was great, you know, because like you said, you know, it's not just one thing that points you 
in the direction of patients needing more help, needing maybe advanced heart failure referral. It's really a combination of things in these patients. I think we spoke about LVAD. We spoke about transplant. Of course, what we do know is not not all patients uh, are able to be candidates. And in some patients, you know, transplant lists are still long. Not everybody who's on the list will get a heart. Uh, We come back to the inotropes that we always talk about. Do you think there's a role for inotropes in heart failure today still? And if yes, what is your approach to starting inotropes uh, in patients? Yeah, so I think there's absolutely a role. Uh, There's a misconception, I believe, that inotropes uh, increase mortality. This is certainly true when you give inotropes uh, on a weekly uh, outpatient basis in patients who may or may not uh, need them over time. Inotropes have an extremely important role, twofold role. One, to stabilize uh, critically ill patients as they are awaiting durable LVAD support and or cardiac transplantation. And second, inotropes have a very important role in palliative care. Frequently, uh, we evaluate patients for heart replacement therapy who are not candidates for um, durable support or transplantations. They may be too old. They may, be, uh, may have other comorbidities that don't allow us to proceed. Or they may even socially, uh, in terms of their support structure, which we haven't talked about at all, which is extremely important uh, for the care of an LVAD or transplant patients, they may not be candidates. And those patients, inotropes, can truly palliate the care, can make the patients feel better. So we not, it's not unusual for us uh, to place a PICC line and sent the patient home on inotropic support. Now, historically, uh, in the rematch study, for example, the outcomes with such an approach are abysmal, but uh, certainly patient feels better. And secondly, there's an emerging body of literature showing that uh, palliative uh, inotropic care actually uh, is much better uh, in terms of survival than, than we had thought. Just to make the patient feel better, I think it's a, very, it's a very important step to get the patient out of the hospital, get them in their home environment, maybe even into hospice, although sometimes it's tricky with inotropes. So I think very important role for inotropes uh, throughout uh, advanced heart failure as a stabilizer and at the end uh, possibly as a quality of life improvement. Underutilized and evaluation for inotrope is not done often enough because during this evaluation, you may be surprised and find that your patient indeed could benefit from inotrope, which really means that they would benefit in terms of survival benefit from transplantation or mechanical circulatory support. No, absolutely. And, and this is something that uh, we ask all the time. Do you prefer an inotrope over the other? I know dobutamine and melanone are the two we use in practice. Yeah, absolutely. I like both. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the... Traditionally, of course, uh, the butamine is a little faster acting. Uh, you don't have to bolus it, and it will get your response right away. It will increase your blood pressure and renal uh, dysfunction, uh, elevated creatinine, low GFR is not an issue, whereas milrinone has uh, also potent pulmonary vasodilatory capacities, which are always welcome in heart failure. But of course, uh, this is a vasodil- an inodilator that also uh, leads to vasodilation, so not so good if blood pressure is already low frequently. And of course, with unstable renal function, not as easy to drive. Having said that, uh, once we uh, have patients stabilized, we prefer to end up, so to speak, on milrinone because of the pulmonary vasodilator effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you need help immediately, dobutamine is the better choice. And I guess this is something, at least in, in the hospital, we do is uh, beta blockers. Uh, we end up sometimes using milrinone a little bit more because... Yeah, very good point. Actually, you can, uh, you know, there are some historic papers about this, how you can use milrinone to initiate uh, a beta blocker in somebody who has been very chronically ill. Uh, that uh, should really be left uh, to, to <laughs> the experts uh, I would say. But yeah, you can give beta blocker and marinone uh, at the same time. Regardless, I think very important to assess whether your patient has a low cardiac output, whether any of their symptoms or the blood pressure or the need to withdraw medications are a result of reduced cardiac output because we can very quickly reverse this and have then 
excellent long-term solutions, transplant of VAT, to, um, to allow, again, as you mentioned earlier, a two-year survival uh, exceeding 80%. Mm-hmm. That really brings us to the last two things I wanted to ask you. Uh, what's the role for palliative care in your practice in these patients? Yeah. How often do you utilize that option? Yeah, very important. Uh, I mean, there are some government regulations. Uh, for example, if you evaluate a patient for so-called destination therapy, LVAT, uh, we haven't provided the definitions, but there's a bridge to transplant where a patient uh, gets a device awaiting heart transplantation, and then there's a so-called destination therapy where uh, transplantation is not uh, planned. Government requires us to have a leapfrog consultation for palliative care in uh, the destination therapy patients. I think it's very important to involve uh, the palliative care team. I think it's equally important for a physician like myself or anybody who really knows the patient well to uh, do the first broad strokes of uh, explaining what palliative care is right away to uh, remove the misconception that we would just let you die if something happens. Really, the idea of palliative care is to shield, to protect, and to allow the patient to have maximum quality of life while undergoing treatments. I think it's extremely important in end-stage heart failure to uh, approach this topic. Patients need to understand uh, how gravely ill they are. This is probably of, uh, let's say, the three big reasons or the three big mistakes why patients are referred too late heart replacement therapy is that the physician doesn't want to communicate the severity of the illness. You know, we talk a lot about cancer, uh, and if cancer has a certain mortality, even 20% at two years, everybody is on big alert and wants to go to a cancer center. If a heart failure patient comes in with an ejection fraction of 20% and a large ventricle of six and a half centimeters, and you have them on a regular medications and they're not feeling well, guess what? The one-year mortality probably is uh, around you know thirty to fifty percent, maybe more, unless uh, there are candidates for heart replacement therapy. But uh, this does not trigger uh, this panic response that we need to do something now that you get when you have you know a, a cancer nodule somewhere. They immediately you know all hands on deck. Let's see what we can do. Even though the mortality for an advanced half life patient is much higher because the disease may have slowly developed uh, over several years, the attention is just not there. That's something that needs to change. Once uh, you tell the patient how high the expected mortality is, it is time to begin to discuss what can we do, what should we do, what do you want us to do. provides, I think, my patients with great comfort when I talk to them about this before surgery. And many patients, when they uh, go for transplantation or for uh, an elevate surgery, more than anything, they want uh, not to be afraid, and they want to be assured that they will not suffer. And I often tell the patients, I cannot guarantee you uh, the outcome of the surgery. You may or may not be a high-risk case, but I can guarantee you that I will do, or our team will do everything we can, so if things don't go the right direction, you will not suffer. This is something that uh, patients really need to hear, that they want to hear, and then they can go relaxed. One can be relaxed going to the OR, but sort of peace of mind uh, to go into into, uh, a major intervention, a transplant or an LVAT. And and like you mentioned, you know, this is really a team approach. We've really moved in the last few years to multidisciplinary team approaches, multiple different physicians really working together, collaborating across various specialties. This really brings me to the next point is that transplant centers are far and few. There are community physicians out there taking care of these patients. In your um, experience, how can we better integrate care in the community and care at these centers? Yeah. So that's, that's again, that's a big challenge for us, right? To, to get to, um, to make sure that the patients are referred to us early on. Again, one of the big conceptions that every patient with heart failure should be seen by a heart failure specialist. That that simply doesn't make any sense because there are way too many uh, heart failure patients in the United States. In contrast, every PCP should be able to provide the care that we discuss, specifically uh, a pharmacotherapy, possibly with the assistance of a cardiologist. 
the the challenge for us is to broadcast um, you know knowledge you know sort of uh, down the stream so to speak or up the stream rather before the patient comes to us for that we do uh, many educational conferences as you know we just finished a, a very successful uh, Monty Hart meeting with almost 300 uh, registrants the lectures uh, covering the entire spectrum of heart failure management medicine uh, valvular therapy transplantation so education of the provider is very important. Direct patient education is done sometimes in a questionable way, but certainly done by the industry uh, trying to um, you know, raise awareness for the disease, often good. Uh, large societies uh, do this. Um, what we need to do is make the PCP understand uh, when to refer the patient. And again, certainly the I need help Acronym, which has actually entered the European guidelines, has uh, is, is is a very simple thing to remember. There are other things like the Seattle Heart Failure Score. They're way too complicated uh, for a practicing physician like myself. Rarely use it, or anybody yeah. uh, who's in practice. It's true. The practicality of some of these large scoring is just difficult to use in most of the patients. So I think uh, thank you, Dr. Yordi, for your time. That was amazing. I think we went over a lot of treatment options in our heart failure patients and really recognition of these advanced heart failure patients, which seems to be key here. I would like to give you an opportunity in the end, if you have any other plugs on you just for Barmonte Heart, would you like to? Yeah, let me just, uh, we've got, if those, those, those listeners who are really interested in mechanical circulatory support, uh, uh, I, I will not let the opportunity go to a pitch uh, for a recent paper from our team in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery where we reported that uh, with implementation of a very rigorous uh, and uh, described in detail team approach on our LVAT program, we have been able to increase the uh, one-year survival or transplantation defined as success uh, using the same device, using the same surgical techniques from 75 uh, to 100% in, in cohorts that were compared historically. I think that's key nowadays, uh, not just for mechanical support, but also for heart failure, that uh, people understand they cannot do this alone, that heart failure occurs along a continuum, and you know the, the chain is only as strong as every, uh, as every single part of it. So yeah, heart failure is a team sport. Heart failure nowadays, maybe that's a different podcast uh, at Montefiore. We also have essentially assumed responsibility for cardiac critical care. I do believe this is a major advantage uh, for our team that when the patient comes in, we have them from beginning to end. But that, that could be a, se a separate podcast yeah. where we can pitch the Montefiore mm -hmm. uh, Critical Care Unit. Thank you so much uh, for being with us, Dr. Yori. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. That was the end of another episode that we had a lot of fun creating. Thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. Please do like and subscribe because it means a lot to us and it helps other listeners find us. You can leave your suggestions for topics, critiques, things we can do better. You can email us at heartsuccessteam at gmail.com. Reach us on our website, heartsuccess.info, our Facebook page at heartsuccessteam, or my Twitter handle, CardioBro. Thank you, guys.